Mark my words, the Federal Reserve will intervene. This is why I think we're in a bottoming process. I think the the bleeding edge of the smart financial actors are actually on Sachs' side and Friedberg's side. But then they're taking that next intellectual leap and saying, okay, well, what happens when Apple basically says, hey, guys, I'm going to have to fire 15% of my employees. I think what happens is the Fed intervenes. In his most recent podcast, Chamath Palihapitiya discussed the big tech starts making cuts and what this means for the broader economy and startups. Chamath shared his thoughts about global debt numbers, Fed incompetency and more. Before listening to him, please ensure to smash the like button and subscribe to the channel. Let's dive into his last interview now. Again, I said it last week, I'll go out on a limb and predict my equivalent November fall predictions. Last fall, it was that the markets were going to poop the bed. My prediction now is that I think the markets are bottoming and consolidating. Yep, 100%. And this is the time, I think, to start nibbling and start getting ready to really rip the money in. And I think there's enough signals every day that kind of like tell me at least that on the margin, it's time because I think the markets do a reasonably good job of digesting news and then pricing the forward reality, right? Like today's price is really everything we already know. And so the real guess is what's about to happen in the future. And from my perspective, I'm actually pretty starting to get a little constructive here. I think that um, when when companies like Facebook really do this and, you know, like if you think about it one way, the financial markets have always had this thing that we have called a Fed put. What does that mean? A put is essentially the right to sell something. And what market participants have always known for the last decade is that if things got very hairy, if there was uncertainty in the market, the Federal Reserve would, and they have, consistently stepped in to create a buyer of last resort. And so it always eliminated that last part of true, you know, supply demand balance, because they would just come and say, don't worry. In many ways in tech, what the big tech companies were, were that, you know, you could never really find what the true market clearing price for an engineer was, or what the true amount of expenses you should spend on office space or, you know, free services. Because you always always had these companies, which was an escalating arms race. You know, if one company had a massage, the next company had gyms and massage and physical therapists, and the other company would have buses to take you to the gyms and massage and therapists, and the next company would have protein shakes that were freshly made. You know, and it just kept escalating and escalating because the costs didn't matter. And they wanted, if nothing else, to get that marginal engineer or product manager or business person to work at their company, which eliminated the risk that they would actually start something to disrupt them. Blocker strategy is very real. You should the blocker that, yeah. strategies are, is very real. So when you take this big tech put out of the market, you will get true price discovery and you will find out what the real price should be for this kind of an engineer, that kind of a product manager. You'll find out what are the real expenses you need to bear in order to build a real lasting business? And you'll be able to sort through all of that stuff out. So I think it's a really good moment. And again, it's yet another indication to me that I think broadly speaking, the markets are now starting to stabilize. All the irrational behavior is starting to exit the system. The party is in the last few hours. Volume's going down, the alcohol is being taken away. People are hanging around with a little bit. Lights are coming on. They're like, I've been here a little too long. And I think that that's a very healthy process for an economy. And I think that that's what's happening right now. So I'm constructive. I'm a little bullish. I'll go I'll go out on a limb. I think, you know, we could be three to five percent from the lows, but we're more near the lows than the highs. We will we will also relive what we have empirically known to be true. And it's been it's been pretty well proven. The investments that one makes in this period will probably be the best for many, many years to come because they'll have the most asymmetric upside. And that was true in 2008 and 9 and 10. It was true in, you know, 2002, 3 and 4. You, I mean, you're talking incredible companies just in those two periods. Think about yep. this. Atlassian, Tesla, Uber, Google, Airbnb, Uber, Instagram, WhatsApp, incredible businesses that have created tremendous value. And so there are businesses that have been invested in for the first time in 2022 and will be invested in for the first time in 2023 and 24 
which will be the leading winners of this next phase and this next leg up. And so the real opportunity is to find out who those companies are and get behind them, I think. Clear. Both Druckenmiller and I can be right, which is he's commenting on the real world economy going into a recession. What I'm saying is that the stock market tends to be nine to 12 months ahead. I think where the, where the problem stands is a central bank that was the same through both of those administrations. And I think we should probably focus on them because you're right, what they did was excessive. And what they essentially said is that if there is volatility beyond a certain amount and people cry uncle, we will not allow the markets to sort themselves out in an orderly way. We will step in. And that's what, you know, again, what we just talked about, the central bank put, in this case, the Fed. Interventions. Put. Yeah. And, and these interventions really uh, pervert a market because you don't know what's going on. And that has huge ramifications in the real economy. So and what this chart shows is essentially all of the hiking cycles that we've gone through since 1983. So 83, 87, 94, 99, 04, 15, and the current one. And here's what uh, I just want to call out for you guys. What's incredible is that other than the one in 83, so this is sort of like, you know, that last big one. What we've seen is that the stock market has a tendency to immediately go to the conclusion very early on in a rate hiking cycle. And now why is that important for normal folks listening to this thing? Well, the reason why that's important is right now we're in month seven of a cycle. We obviously don't know how long it's going to be, but the odds are improving every day that we're near the end versus the beginning. And why that's important is, again, if you're thinking about when to, you know, buy equities, for example, this is a really instructive guide because what it tells you is the closer we get to the end, or more importantly, the closer we psychologically know that the end is coming, we start buying. And, that, and that's just a broad-based statement that has been true. So, you know, what you see right now, I think, is really interesting, which is that despite all the bad information, oh my gosh, the Nord Stream pipeline blew up. Could it have been sabotage? Was it the CIA? Was it the Russians? Oh my gosh, big tech is slowing spending and firing people. China's in a coup. I don't know if you saw that rumor. Yeah. Or how about something more benign? You know, the, the US, you know, US yuan is really trading in a crazy way. The US euro is trading in a crazy way. The US pound is the going pound, crazy. Yeah. Despite all of that, every time we trade down, the market consolidates very quickly. And we sort of like, so I think we're forming a bottom. I do think that Stan is right. We are going to see a hard landing recession. Something will break in 2023. I hope it doesn't. I hope it doesn't affect what? a lot of normal people, but it's likely. But at the what, same what time- What do define hard landing as? So I'll tell you in a second. But at the same time, I think what's happening is in the equity and financial markets, we are consolidating a bottom because we're seeing through to that end state. And this is where cheap equity gets bought. So why is there a reason to sell now? I think a lot of the people that are selling, the smart money sellers that I talk to, are essentially right now selling to book in capital losses to offset other capital gains from this year, a term that's called tax loss harvesting. And so if you have gains through this year, which some of us do, this is the great moment to just sell the losers, to book the loss, to net it out so that you can minimize your taxes for next year. That's probably, I think, where we are at. And I think that's why they're still consolidated buying. So what is the hard landing, Jason? If I had to predict, I think what David said is absolutely right. You're going to see unemployment get to an awkward and uncomfortable number. Five, six percent, I think, could be something that we see. And I think you're going to see a lot more companies pull way back on their spend because demand is going to really modulate. Oh, you know, I'll give you an, a crazy example. You know, what happens to all the people in the United States that are on ARM mortgages? right? Adjustable rate mortgages. When those things reset, they're going to reset two, 300 basis points higher. Their monthly payments are going are going to go nuclear. Oh, it's already happened. Shumat. I in, literally had a family member call me about this. And they were like, what do I do? So in the they UK, the yeah. in the UK, 40% of all mortgage dollars are interest only arms that will yep. reset in January to around 4%. 40%. Can you imagine how upside down the UK economy is going to be when 
people have to spend three and four times more to keep well, their home. And then people have to go to work. So people who have not been participating are going to have those bills come in and they're going to have to go to work. They're going to have to go to work. It means nothing. And I'll tell you why. These people keep Because like, you can print more money? You print more money. I'm sorry yes. to be the bearer of bad news, but like it is not as if we have a law, a constitutional law, or it's not as if governments have collectively decided that you cannot have debt to GDP uh, above a certain number. That doesn't happen, guys. We passed 100 under Obama and we've just kept printing money. So whether we like it or not, and I'm not saying I'm a fan of this or it's right, we are kicking the can down the road. And what we're doing is we're extending the maturities. You know, you'll eventually have 100 year government bonds, okay? Just like you have like now, you know, multi-decade long corporate bonds. Right. I think the Liz Trust thing is really actually a microcosm of how unfortunately Western governments are working. But I think there's a silver lining. Like she basically came in a day after she got elected and said, okay, guess what, guys? At the same time, I'm going to massively cut taxes and I'm going to give you fiscal stimulus. I'm going to cap your energy bills and I'm going to have these huge transfer payments from the government into the hands of, uh, of um, British citizens. I'm not going to comment on whether that's right or right, right or wrong. But the financial markets, to your point, David, absolutely hated it. And within a few days, you basically saw the pound get crushed. But then what did you see? You saw the Bank of England decide that financial stability was more important than financial viability, meaning the things that she wanted to do were not viable. So you could have let the financial markets sort this out, which would have forced the prime minister to basically abandon the policy. But instead, the BOE said, no, we're an unlimited buyer of UK gilts, which is the name of the UK bond. And everything snapped back. We're back to where we were before her speech and before the chancellor of the exchequer's speech. And so it's as if nothing happened. And that's what's so insane to me, which is that even though the Bank of England, by the way, in the next week or two are going to raise rates 140 basis points, 140 basis points, almost double what the Fed has done the last three times. They're doing both at the same time. They're both raising rates and they're acting as a backstop for bad policy. And this is what's wrong right now in the world. We do not have a real check and balance. So, so my point to Friedberg is just that I'm like emotionally in, on your side. But the problem is, with these folks keep getting bailed out, David, they're just going to keep doing this stuff. And there's no end in sight. Mark my words, the Federal Reserve will intervene. This is why I think we're in a bottoming process. I think the, the bleeding edge of the smart financial actors are actually on Sachs' side and Friedberg's side. But then they're taking that next intellectual leap and saying, okay, well, what happens when Apple basically says, hey, guys, I'm going to have to fire 15% of my employees. I think what happens is the Fed intervenes. And I'm, I'm just using Apple as an example. But there, there is a threshold of demand destruction, Jason. I think you're right, where we have the Fed put, come back on the table, and the markets just go bonkers. They're going to they're gonna get to four and a half very quickly. And then this something's going to break, like all these guys are saying. I think they're right. And then the Fed put comes back on the table. And we'll have this, Balance. we'll have the UK, you know, the UK thing happened in, what, six days? Ours will play out over six or nine months. But it's going to play out the exact same way. We're at hard landing. Like, right. are these people are not competent. Are they just not competent? No, I think they're really, I think they are competent. But I think that they're a little bit fighting with one hand tied behind their back. I think if you had to take the other side, Sachs, you know, the problem is they have a very specific strain of data that they focus on. And that data has all these weird anomalies to it. Like, you know, they should look at rent data. But the way that the rent data works is that, you know, you bleed it in one sixth a month over six months, just as, a, as an odd example, or like used car data only comes in a certain way. So right, if you went to a board of directors meeting for your company and said, how's the business doing? And the CEO says, well, you know, well, we're, we're going to have data from six months ago. And it's like, okay, I got that. But what about like last week? Uh, you would fire that CEO to your point, Jason. Um, and these things are knowable today. Like there are businesses, for example, that are selling billions of dollars worth of like IOT sensors here and there, energy sensors here. Everything is connected to the internet. Everything is automated. Everything is running in code. Um, you would think that the government would say there's a national level directive here to get this into some kind of a system that we can use because these decisions are becoming more and more important. I think that would be a wonderful idea and a project and it would have huge value. Think about ZERP, which if you look back, 
what really happened, if you think about like how people live their lives every day, what, what, have, what has happened in our view of government and politicians? It's really eroded since 2007, 2008, right? There's huge amounts of rancor. Nobody gets along. Everything tends to happen on partisan lines. And the reason I think that that was allowed to happen or that accelerated is actually because of ZERP. Because if you think about it, if you had failed policy, right, and the economy was completely broken, politicians would actually have to get together and try to solve the problem themselves. And the last time they really did that was actually in the great financial crisis. If you look at TARP, and if you look at how all of these smart people actually had to get together in a bipartisan way to figure out how do we bail out America and prevent a banking crisis, that was the last real effort that touched a lot of people. But then, David, as you said, at the, on the heels of that, we broke the glass and we've been fighting ever since. And the peak of that fighting was basically Donald Trump getting elected. And so I think like what it shows is that if you have these irrational central bankers that will are, that are willing to constantly bail people out, you will never get a high functioning government because policy is irrelevant. Good policy doesn't matter. I Bad think we're, policy we're, doesn't matter. If any of it goes wrong, the central banker will come in and bail us out.